Okay. Remind me in a couple of chapters because nobody talks about that. <laughs> I didn't. The whole time I'm like, first of all, I was worried when she just went, like when she wasn't at the apartment. And I know the elevator boy probably, you know, she's like, but he's got to go out. Who's walking him? Okay, sorry. Um, part 19, no, part 18, understanding why. I couldn't sleep all night. A foghorn was groaning incessantly on the sound, and I tossed, half sick between grotesque reality and savage, frightening dreams. Toward dawn, I heard a taxi go up to Gatsby's Drive, and immediately I jumped out of bed and began to dress. I felt that I had something to tell him, something to, to warn him about, and morning would be too late. Crossing his lawn, I saw that his front door was still open, and he was leaning against a table in the hall, heavy with dejection or sleep. Nothing happened, he said wanly. I waited, and almost four o'clock, she came to the window and stood there for a minute and then turned out the light. So she did follow the plan. I'm safe. I'm going to bed. His house had never seemed so enormous as it did to me that night when we hunted through the great rooms for cigarettes. We pushed aside curtains that were like pavilions and felt over innumerable feet of dark wall for electric light switches. Once, I tumbled with a sort of splash upon the keys of a ghostly piano. There was an inexplicable amount of dust everywhere, and the rooms were musty as though they hadn't been aired for many days. Why this house that, you know, is huge and wonderful and they had all these parties and why is it suddenly dusty and smells musty? Remember, they, they fired the people that were cleaning it and people haven't been in there because he had Daisy over and he didn't want all the witnesses, right? So they haven't really, so it's kind of like, and you know, if people aren't in a place, dust happens pretty fast, you know? And then there's a smell that is just kind of like closed up, you know? I found the humidor on an unfamiliar table with two stale dry cigarettes inside. Throwing open the French windows in the, of the drawing room, we sat smoking out into the darkness. You ought to go away, I said. It's pretty certain they'll trace your car. Go away now, old sport? Go to Atlantic City for a week or up to Montreal. He wouldn't consider it. He couldn't possibly leave Daisy until he knew what she was going to do. He was clutching at some last hope and I couldn't bear to shake him free. Okay, so underline that. He's got this eternal optimism, right? He's got this hope. He doesn't, you know, change his mind about what he wants to happen or what he knows is going to happen. He was clutching at some last hope and could it be, I couldn't bear to shake him free. Okay, so now remember back in like chapter six when he told us all about Dan Cody and all of that. And I told you that it didn't happen right then. This is when he actually told Nick all of this. Okay, it's in the middle of the night. It's after or like in the early morning. They're sitting there. Um, and this is when Gatsby tells him the truth about the past because this is when it kind of is needed. Okay, Nick just shares it with us earlier. It was this night that he told me the strange story of his youth with Dan Cody. Told it to me because Jay Gatsby had broken up like glass against Tom's hard malice and the long secret extravaganza was played out. I think that he would have acknowledged anything now without reserve, but he wanted to talk about Daisy. She was the first nice girl he had ever known. In various unrevealed capacities, he had come in contact with such people but always with indiscernible barbed wire between. He found her excitingly desirable. He went to her house, at first with other officers from Camp Taylor, then alone. It amazed him. He had never been in such a beautiful house before. But what gave it an air of breathless intensity was that Daisy lived there. It was as casual a thing to her as his tent out at camp was to him. There was a ripe mystery about it a hint of bedrooms upstairs more beautiful and cool than other bedrooms, of gay and radiant activities taking place through its corridors, and of romances that were not musty and laid away already in lavender, but fresh and breathing and redolent of this year's shining motor cars and of dances whose flowers were scarcely withered. It excited him too that many men had already loved Daisy. It increased her value in his eyes. He felt their presence all about the house, pervading the air with the shades and echoes of still vibrant emotions. 
So y'all, he's talking about five years ago when he first met Daisy and he first went into her house. Remember, he's four. His, you know, he was loafing on a, before the war, he was loafing without shoes on, you know, like, and remember he was expected to do janitorial work. So this house is just beautiful. She's beautiful. And it's normal to her. When you grow up rich, this is it, you know, and, and if, if people who don't have all this stuff, they come to your place and they're like, oh my goodness, you're just like, oh, I never thought about that. Yeah, it is, you know, it's just normal, but not to him. So he's just like, and then Al, I saw some of you um, underline this. This is good. The fact that other men loved her and wanted her, it made her more desirable to him. So it excited him too that many men had already loved Daisy. It increased her value in his eyes. Should that be a moniker that you put on someone? It shouldn't. But for some reason, because other men wanted her, because other men, you know, had been with her and wanted, you know, had dated her, had, um, you know, spent time with her, that made her better for him. It should be, I think. Right. Because and again, it's not like necessarily like not saying that she's like a slut or anything, yeah. but the fact that she is worldly in terms of she dates a lot of people and a lot of people want to date her. Yeah. Today, you kind of don't want, you know, you're kind of like, OK, you know, it's kind of dirty, gross, you know. Um, and again, it's probably not the same meaning as today being with a lot of people, but there still is. She's not like this, you know, very um, innocent flower and stuff. She a lot of people she spends time and, and y'all know, Daisy, she loves attention. So she's been getting this attention. And for some reason that makes him want her more and love her more. And again, that's a very superficial tag to put on it. I mean, that is outwardly materialistic, right? Okay. But he knew that he was in Daisy's house by a colossal accident. However glorious might be his future as Jay Gatsby, he was at present a penniless young man without a past. And at any moment, the invisible cloak of his uniform might slip from his shoulders. So he made the most of his time. He took what he could get, ravenously and unscrupulously. Eventually, he took Daisy one still October night, took her because he had no real right to touch her hand. Now, this is actually talking about sex, okay? So make sure that y'all y'all realize that. He knows that he is not in her league. He knows that he doesn't have any money, and that she really shouldn't be with him. And at any moment, she's going to probably realize that and make that decision or her parents are going to make that decision, you know, be like, nope. Cause remember rich girls don't marry poor boys. Um, he doesn't have a pass. He doesn't have, you know, the, um, you know, all the different things that he, he should have to be with her. So he uses his time wisely. And this is not a, um, a in my mind, it's not a proud moment for him. He doesn't realize when she's going to um, realize it. So he uses time and he takes advantage of that. Okay. He sleeps with her because he, she might tomorrow realize that he's not good enough. So when it says um, unscrupulously, that's without morals. Okay. Um, and again, he knows that if she was fully aware of his lack of money and his lack of past and his lack of stature and all that, she wouldn't be with him. So before she figures it out, let me hurry up and get what I can. That's kind of. He might have despised himself, for he had certainly taken her under false pretenses. I don't mean that he had traded on his phantom millions, but he had deliberately given Daisy a sense of security. Let her let he had let her believe that he was a person from much of the same stratum as herself, that he was fully able to take care of her. So he didn't lie right out and say, "Look, I have millions, and my family left me all this money, and da da da." But he didn't tell her that literally all he owned was the uniform. And think about it, this is how he could get away with it. He's an officer in the army. What I mean, they have to wear uniforms. They have to wear the same uniform. You know what I mean? And remember, he had been taught by Dan Cody about um, the way that's act, right? So he had that down. So again, he didn't fool right out lie and say, I, you know, all the stuff that he's lied about to Nick and all that kind of stuff. But he deliberately didn't tell her some things, okay? Um, as a matter of fact, he had so much, he had no such faculties. He had no comfortable family standing behind him. And he was liable at the whim of an impersonal government to be blown anywhere about the world. But he didn't despise himself. And it didn't turn out as he had imagined. He had intended probably to take what he could and go. So he was literally like some people do, not just men. 
Some people just think they're going to have sex with somebody and get what they can for the couple nights or that night and, and leave and not think about it. But he fell for her. He, he caught feelings. Is that what it is? <laughs> oh, sorry. <clears throat> he had intended probably to take what he couldn't go. But now he found that he had committed himself to the following of a grail. He knew that Daisy was extraordinary, but he didn't realize how just how extraordinary a nice girl could be. She vanished into her rich house, into her rich, full life, leaving Gatsby nothing. He felt married to her, and that was all. When they met again two days later, it was Gatsby who was breathless, who was somehow betrayed. Her porch was bright, and the bought, with the bought luxury of the starshine, the wicker of the settee squeaked fashionably as she turned toward him, and he kissed her curious and lovely mouth. She had caught a cold, and it made her voice huskier and more charming than ever. And Gatsby was overwhelmingly aware of the youth and mystery that wealth imprisons and preserves, of the freshness of many clothes, and of Daisy, gleaming like silver, safe and proud above the hot struggles of the poor. So in those two days, he realizes, wow, you know, like I, I want to be with her and I got to do everything I can to be with her. Uh, when before it was just, all right, let's just sleep together tonight and then, you know, not really worry about it. And again, part of her beauty, you guys, is because of how rich she is. It's because of what she has. It's because of the life that she lives. That's part of her beauty. Life lesson, don't let that be part of who you fall for. Okay, money and status does not, you know what I mean? Like, but... This, I'm going to read the rest of this as a cautionary tale. <laughs> I can't believe, no, I can't describe to you how surprised I was to find out I loved her old sport. Underline that. <clears throat> I can't describe to you how surprised I was to find out I loved her old sport. I even hoped for a while that she'd throw me over, but she didn't because she was in love with me too. So for a while, he's like, maybe she'll break up with me. You know what I mean? Like, and maybe I can get, um, like, I'll be heartbroken, but, but she didn't because she loved him too. She thought I knew a lot because I knew different things from her. Well, there I was, way off in my ambitions, getting deeper in love every minute. And all of a sudden, I didn't care. What was the use of doing great things if I could have a better time telling her what I was going to do? On the last afternoon before he went abroad, he sat with Daisy in his arms for a long, silent time. It was a cold fall day with fire in the room and her cheeks flushed. Now and then she moved and he changed his arm a little. And once he kissed her dark, shining hair. The afternoon may had made them tranquil for a while, as if to give them <clears throat> a deep memory for the long parting the next day promised. They had never been closer in their month of love, nor communicated more profoundly one with another than when she brushed silent lips against his coat shoulder or when he touched the end of her fingers gently as though she were asleep. So how long were they actually together? A month. But he fell hard. She fell hard. Um, obviously, he fell hard. You know, for five years, he y'all, and you you realize this. He did not see another woman. Yeah, he did not. I mean, yeah, you know what I mean. And it's one of those like every every choice he made, everything he did in the war, everything was to get back to Daisy, and that was the plan. Um, say what you will about him, you know, like, obviously, um, like Selene said, simp or whatnot, but commitment, he's got the commitment thing down, you know what I mean? Like, dang, he did extraordinarily well in the war. He was a captain before he went to the front and following the Argonon battles, he got his majority and the command of his divisional machine guns. After the armistice, he tried frantically to get home but some complication or misunderstanding sent him to Oxford instead. He was worried now. There was a quality of nervous despair in Daisy's letters. She didn't see why he couldn't come. She was feeling the pressure of the world outside and she wanted to see him and feel his presence beside her and be reassured that she was doing the right thing after all. What is the right thing? Waiting for him. But again, she's gonna get restless. Think about it. Daisy's got all this attention. She's got all these people wanting to be with her, but she's, you know, she's writing letters to this guy because she loves him and she's just waiting for him to return home so they can be together. But he, um, 
he's not for whatever happens, you know, and, the, and the, you can't just say when you want to get out, you can't just say when the war is going to be over. Right. I mean, the, the military is in charge. And so he can sense it in her letter. She's getting worried. She's like, come on, you know, and when it says the pressures of the world, think about what pressures these young, rich people, you know, girls have and, you know, to get married and to start their life. And if you're waiting on someone and he's not here, um, I guess you're going to truly see how much um, love she had for him. Um, but the fact that she said, and be reassured that she was doing the right thing after all. She says, I'm going to wait for you. I'm waiting for you. But with each letter, he kind of gets the idea that she's, it's getting harder and harder for her to, um, to wait. <clears throat> for Daisy was young and her artificial world was redolent with orchids and, pl and um, pleasant. I'll start over. For Daisy was young and the artificial world was redolent of orchids and pleasant, cheerful snobbery and orchestras, which set the rhythm of the year, summing up the sadness and suggestions of life in new tunes. All night, the saxophones wailed the hopeless comment of Beale Street Blues, while a hundred pair of golden and silver slippers shuffled the shining dust. At the great tea hour, there were always rooms that throbbed incessantly with this low, sweet fever, while fresh faces drifted here and there like rose petals, blown by the sad horns around the floor. So this is her her coming out. This is her time when she should be, um, you know, with her her beau, with her man. And she sees all these other people doing it and they're dancing and they're dressing up. And she's, so she's knowing what she knows. She's also very materialistic, right? She also needs to have the person on her arm and the right dress and all that kind of stuff. So she's gonna, she started getting impatient. This is Nick, but he, he's saying what Gatsby told him. Yeah. Um, through the twilight universe, Daisy began to move again with the season. Suddenly, she was again keeping half a dozen dates a day with half a dozen men and drowsing sleep at dawn with the um, beads and the chiffon of an evening dress tangled among dying orchids on the floor beside her bed. And all the time, something within her was crying for a decision. She wanted her life shaped now, immediately. And the decision must be made by some force of love, of money, of unquestionable practicality that was close at hand. So she's getting to the point she starts seeing other people. She starts, um, and I'm sure she tells him that. And he's he's like, crap, I can't get there, though. You know, like, I want to be there. Don't you understand? But she's lost patience. And she wants her life to start. She sees it. And I've told probably told you guys this before. But when I turned 30 that year, when all my friend group from college and high school turned 30, I went to seven weddings. Some of them, they had married somebody they'd been dating for a while, but like probably four of them had just met in the last like year. They freaked out because they didn't want to be 30 and single. That was what society told them. You're not supposed to be 30 and single. Um, and so this is what it reminds me of. Like she wanted it right then because other people are, you know, she's not 30, but that just happened at my um, thing. And literally within five years, like four of them are divorced, you know what I mean? Because it wasn't right. And they rushed into it, but she could not wait. She wanted to have the house and the status and the husband and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Okay. That force took shape in the middle of spring with the arrival of Tom Buchanan. There was a wholesome bulkiness about his person and his position. And Daisy was flattered. Doubtless, there was a certain struggle and a certain relief. The letter reached Gatsby while he was still at Oxford. So she sent him the letter and said, I'm getting married to this guy, Tom Buchanan. And again, it works. He's rich. He's here. He's, um, you know, uh, he's good looking. He's got the the name, all the stuff. And so I'm just like, I, I can't wait for this, this officer anymore. So meanwhile, he can't get home. He's trying so hard to be with the one that he loves. And he gets the letter that says, I'm getting married to somebody else. Okay, so that ends um, part, uh, no, yeah, it does. It ends part 18. And I'm going to keep this um, recording because um, these are smaller ones. So part 19 is called, they're a rotten crowd. The they're like, they are a rotten crowd. It was dawn now in Long Island, and we went about opening the rest of the windows downstairs filling the house with gray tuning, gold turning light. The shadow of a tree fell abruptly across the dew and ghostly birds began to sing among the blue leaves. There was a slow, pleasant movement in the air, scarcely a wind, promising a cool, lovely day. 
I don't think she ever loved him. Gatsby turned um, around from her window and looked at me challengingly. You must remember, old sport, that she was very excited this afternoon. He told her those things in a way that, that frightened her, that made it look as if I was some kind of cheap sharper. And the result was that she hardly knew what she was saying. Does it sound like he's convincing Nick or himself? Right. And so he's like, you know, and of course he's thinking about it, you know, going back. And we always do that. We always relive every little thing that happened. Right. And try to rationalize it and make it work for the way we want it to work. He sat down gloomily. Of course, she might have loved him just for a minute, even when they were for, uh, when they were first married. But love me even more then. Do you see? Suddenly he came out with a curious remark. In any case, he said it was it was just personal. What could you make of that? except to suspect some intensity in his conception of the affair that couldn't be measured. So he, the, the way he saw the affair, the way he saw the relationship was definitely, um, that part of it was one-sided. She loved him, of course, but not enough to wait and definitely not enough to um, right then or right now not be with him, okay? Because remember, she went to sleep but today is the day where she should be packing up, leaving Tom and coming over, right? He came back from um, France when Tom and Daisy were still on their wedding trip and had made a miserable but irresistible journey to Louisville on the last of his army pay. He stayed there a week, walking the streets where their footsteps had clicked together through the November night and revisiting the out-of-the-way places to which they had driven in her white car. Just as Daisy's house had always seemed to him more mysterious and gay than other houses, so his idea of the city itself, even though she was gone from it, was pervaded with a melancholy beauty. So y'all, he knew she wasn't gonna be there. He knew that she was married and gone, but he still used the last of his money to go back and just be where she was. Like that's a commitment, you know what I mean? Like, so he goes and he visits all these out of the way places where they went. And again, he doesn't know what he's going to do now. He's out of the army. He doesn't have any money. Um, so he left feeling that if he had searched harder, he might have found her, that he was leaving her behind. The day coach, he was penniless now, was hot. He went out to the open vestibule and sat down on a folding chair. And then the station slid away and the backs of unfamiliar beings, building, sorry, moved by. Then out into the spring fields where a yellow trolley raced them for a minute with the people in it who might once have seen the pale magic of her face along the casual street. Again, very melodramatic, right? He's leaving and I mean, he's, he's on the, the train out of town and he's like, he sees people and he's like, I wonder if they ever saw her. You know what I mean? Like I just, I mean, and, and on one side you're like, yeah, that's like true commitment. And that's like love. And on the other side, I'm like, dude, she's married. You know, like life is too short. Like, huh. so yeah, I'm, I'm stuck in the middle there. Uh, the track curved and now it was going away from the sun, which as it sank lower, seemed to spread itself in benediction over the vanishing city where she had drawn her breath. He stretched out his hand desperately as if to snatch only a wisp of air to save a fragment of the spot that she had made lovely for him. I do like that line. Um, to save a fragment of the spot that she had made lovely for him. He remembers that time and she did make him very happy right then. You know what I mean? But it was all going by too fast now for his blurred eyes. And he knew that he had lost that part of it, the freshest and the best forever. It was nine o'clock when we finished breakfast and we went out into the porch. The night had made a sharp difference in the weather and there was an autumn flavor in the air. The gardener, the last of one of Gatsby's former servants came to the foot of the steps. I'm going to drain the pool today, Mr. Gatsby. The leaves will start falling pretty soon and then there's always trouble with the pipes. Don't do it today, Gatsby answered. He turned to me apologetically. You know, old sport, I haven't used that pool all summer. He looked at my watch. I looked at my watch and stood up, 12 minutes to my train. Y'all, Nick has to go to work. My man has been, you know, in, talking with him all night. He got up at four and now it's almost, you know, whew. I didn't want to go to the city. I wasn't worth a decent stroke of work, but it was more than that. I didn't want to leave Gatsby. I missed that train and then another before I could get myself away. I'll call you up, I said finally. Do, old sport. I'll call you about noon. 
Uh, we walked slowly down the steps. I suppose Daisy will call too. He looked at me anxiously as if he hoped that I'd cooperate this. I suppose so. Well, goodbye. So again, he's waiting. Y'all, you can't take optimism away from this man. Like you can't take away his hope. She's gonna call, okay? I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna wait and she's gonna call. And Nick's just kind of like, hope so. Yeah, he doesn't want to like break that. You know, like when you have somebody that optimistic, you don't want to be the one that's the, the you know, the, the naysayer, but. Uh, we shook hands and I started away. Just before I reached the hedge, I remembered something and turned around. They're a rotten crowd, I shouted across the lawn. You're worth the whole damn bunch put together. Who's he talking about? Tom, Daisy, Jordan. I mean, think about it. And again, I don't know who Gatsby thinks that he's talking about, um, but he's definitely including Daisy on that, right? He doesn't say it, but but um, so highlight that. They're a rotten crowd. You're worth the whole damn bunch put together. I've always been glad I said that. It was the only compliment I ever gave him because I disapproved of him from beginning to end. First, he nodded politely, and then his face broke into that radiant and understanding smile as if we'd been in ecstatic cahoots on that fact all the time. His gorgeous pink rag of a suit made a bright spot of color against the white steps, and I thought of the night when I first came to his ancestral home three months before. The lawn and drive had been crowded with the faces of those who guessed at his corruption, and he had stood on those steps, concealing his incorruptible dream as he waved him goodbye. Underline concealing his incorruptible dream. So that first party, did Nick know what was going to turn out three months later? He didn't know why he was throwing the parties. He didn't know about Daisy. He didn't know any of this. But the fact that Gatsby did, that was part of the plan. His incorruptible dream. I thanked him for his hospitality. We were always thanking him for that. I and the others. Goodbye, I called. I enjoy breakfast, Gatsby. Up in the city, I tried for a while to list the quotations on an interminable amount of stock. Then I fell asleep in my swivel chair. Just before noon, um, the phone woke me. And I started up with sweat breaking out on my forehead. It was Jordan Baker. She often called me at this hour because the uncertainty of her own movements between hotels and clubs and private houses made her hard to find in any other way. She just used her cell phone. I mean, Usually her voice came over the wire as something fresh and cool, as if a divot from a green golf links had come sailing in the office window. But this morning it seemed harsh and dry. I've left Daisy's house, she said. I'm at Hampstead and I'm going down to Southampton this afternoon. Probably it had been tactful to leave Daisy's house, but the act annoyed me. And her next remark made me rigid. You weren't so nice to me last night. How could it have mattered then? for a silent silence for a moment then. However, I want to see you. I want to see you too. Suppose I don't go to Southampton and come into town this afternoon. No, I don't think this afternoon. Very well. It's impossible this afternoon. Various, we talked like that for a while and then abruptly we weren't talking any longer. I don't know which of us hung up with um, a sharp click, but I know I didn't care. I couldn't have talked to her across the tea table that day if I never talked to her again in this world. So he's just like, you're mad because you think I was mean to you? A woman died, you know what I mean? And like, and she doesn't know. Daisy did it, you say it or how, you know what I mean? Like there's just so much and, and it doesn't seem like she cares to know. She's not asking questions, you know what I mean? And so it's disgusting him, which it should, it should have already discussed him a long time ago. Exactly, like what, you know, yeah. I called Gatsby's house a few minutes later, but the line was busy. I tried four times. Finally, an exasperated central told me the wire was being kept open for a long distance from Detroit. Taking my out my timetable, I drew a small circle around the 350 train. Then I leaned back in my chair and I tried to think. It was just noon. So back then you had operators on the phone, okay? And you can get people to like, or you could get them to like break in like if there was somebody actually talking. But apparently he wasn't actually on the phone, but he wasn't taking any calls except for this specific one from Detroit is what the operator told him. OK. All right. So that's the end of 19.
And then the last part that we're going to read today is called um, Where is Wilson? So now last we had um, last we saw Wilson, who's um, very, very upset. Um, and he is he was in the office. Tom got somebody to kind of stay with him. Um, but he knew that Tom wasn't driving the car, but he also knew that it was a yellow car. And he was just, I mean, very upset, which, as you can tell I me, mean, he was like he was moaning. OK, so part 20. Where is Wilson? When I passed the ash heaps on the train that morning, I crossed deliberately to the other side of the car. I suppose there'd be a curious crowd um, around there all day with little boys searching for dark spots in the dust and some garrulous man telling over and over what had happened until it became less and less real, even to him, and he could tell it no longer. And Myrtle Wilson's tragic achievement was forgotten. Now I want to go back a little and tell what happened at the garage after we left there the night before. So put an asterisk right there. He's telling us now, because um, he found this out later, but he wants to tell us after they left Tom there, I'm sorry, after Tom left um, George there, this is what happened, okay? They had difficulty in locating the sister, Catherine. She must have broken her rule against drinking that night, for when she arrived, she was stupid with liquor and unable to understand that the ambulance had already gone to Flushing. When they convinced her of this, she immediately fainted, as if that was the intolerable part of the affair. Someone, kind or curious, took her in his car and drove her in the wake of her sister's body. Until long after midnight, a changing crowd lapped up against the front of the garage while George Wilson rocked himself back and forth on the couch inside. For a while, the door of the office was open and everyone who came into the garage glanced irresistibly through it. Finally, someone said it was a shame and closed the door. Michaelis and several other men were with him First, four or five men, later, two or three men. Still later, Michaelis had to ask the last stranger to wait there 15 minutes longer while he went back to his own place and made a pot of coffee. After that, he stayed there alone with Wilson until dawn. So remember, Michaelis runs the restaurant, the, the Greek restaurant beside it. Um, and so George, he doesn't have a bunch of friends. You know what I mean? He had his wife and she's gone. And so literally these people are being kind, but there's pretty much the strangers. And Michaelis wants to, you know, so he goes back and he gets somebody to stay with him so he's not alone. Um, and then he comes back. About three o'clock, the quality of Wilson's incoherent muttering changed. He grew quieter and began to talk about the yellow car. This is three in the morning, okay, after it happened. He announced that he had a way of finding out whom the yellow car had belonged to. And then he blurted out that a couple of months ago, his wife had come from the city with her face bruised and her nose swollen. Okay, and if I'd never thought about that until I read this first time. I'm like, yeah, how did she explain that? She left to go to her sister's and her nose was fine. And then she comes back and she's got a broken nose and it's swollen. So what did she say? I fell, I hit a door, you know? Um, so he's talking about that, um, but go back where it says he announced that he had a way of finding out whom the yellow car belonged to. What do you think his way is? He does, but there's a more specific way. Who was the last person he saw in that car? Tom. So he can ask Tom. Tom said it wasn't him. So who is, is it? You know, and so that is a, de so write that. He could ask Tom. He, that's his quote unquote definite way of finding out who belonged to the yellow car. But when he heard himself say this, he flinched and began to cry, oh my God, again in his groaning voice. Michael has made a clumsy attempt to distract him. H how long you been married, George? Come on there, try to sit still a minute and answer my question. How long you been married? 12 years. Ever had any children? Come on, George, sit still. I asked you a question. Did you, did you ever have any kids? The hard brown beetles kept, uh, kept thudding against the dull light. And whenever Michael has heard a car go tearing along the road outside, it sounded to him like the car that hadn't stopped a few hours before. He didn't like to go in the garage because the workbench was staying there the where the body had been lying. So he moved uncomfortable around the office. He knew every object in it before morning. And from time to time, he sat down beside Wilson trying to keep him more quiet. Haven't you, uh, have you got a church you go to sometimes, George? Maybe if, if you haven't even been there in a long time, maybe I could call the church and get a priest to come over and he could talk to you, see? So usually people have somebody, right? Like a, a, a minister or somebody that could make them, you know, feel better. Don't belong to any. Well, you ought to have a church, George. For times like this, 
you, you must have gone to church once. Uh, didn't you get married in a church? Listen, George, listen to me. Didn't you get married in a church? It was a long time ago. The effort of answering broke the rhythm of his rocking. For a moment, he was silent. Then the same half-knowing, half-bewildered look came back into his faded eyes. Look in that drawer there, he said, pointing at the desk. Which drawer? That drawer, that one. Michaelis opened the drawer nearest his hand. There was nothing in it but a small, expensive dog leash made of leather and braided silver. It was apparently new. This? He inquired, holding it up. Wilson stared and nodded. I found it yesterday afternoon. She tried to tell me about it, but I knew it was something funny. So do you think this could be part of how he's found out about the affair? Because again, we don't have a lot of money. Why are you buying um, a very expensive dog leash for a dog we don't even have? So that's going to start questions, right? So this is probably how he started to find out. You mean your wife bought it? But Michaels doesn't know this, right? So Michaels is like, why are you showing me a dog leash? She had it wrapped in tissue paper on her bureau. Michaelis didn't see anything odd in that, and he gave Wilson a dozen reasons why his wife might have bought a dog leash. But conceivably, Wilson had heard some of these same explanations before from Myrtle because he began saying, oh, my God, again in a whisper. His comforter left several explanations in the air. Then he killed her, said Wilson. His mouth dropped open suddenly. Who did? I have a way of finding out. You're morbid, George, said his friend. This has been a strain to you, and you don't know what you're saying. You'd better try and, and, and sit quiet till morning. He murdered her. It was an accident, George. Wilson shook his head. His eyes narrowed and his mouth widened slightly at the ghost of a superior. Huh. I know, he said definitely. I'm one of those trusting fellows, and I don't think any harm to nobody. But when I get to know a thing, I know it. It was the man in that car. She ran out to speak to him and he wouldn't stop. So what does George think happened? Or whoever she's having an affair with was the one in the car and he killed her on purpose. So could not be farther from the truth, right? But this is where the actions, because he saw her, it looked like she was running out to someone that she knew, which she thought she was, right? And so he didn't see who was driving. He didn't pay attention to that. But he did see that, um, or what he thought he saw was that the guy did it on purpose. Um, and he not only had an affair with her, but then killed her. Okay. Michaelis had seen this too, but it hadn't occurred to him that there was any special significance in it. He believed that Mrs. Wilson had been running away from her husband rather than trying to stop any particular car. Remember, Michaelis knew that he he told him, he's like, I got my wife kept up there. So he saw it as her leaving and it, literally like it was an accident. How could she have been like that? She, she's a deep one, said Wilson, as if that answered the question. He began to rock again and Michaelis stood twisting the leash in his hand. Maybe you got some, some friend I could telephone for, George? This was a forlorn hope. He was almost sure that Wilson had no friend. There was not enough of him for his wife. Y'all understand that? Just very like it was his whole life was her. You know what I mean? And it just wasn't um, his own man. We've already talked about that. But there wasn't enough of him for his wife. He was glad a little later when he noticed a change in the room, a blue quickening by the window, and realized that dawn wasn't far off. About five o'clock, it was blue enough outside to snap off the light. Wilson's glazed eyes turned toward the ash heaps where small gray clouds took on fantastic shapes and scurried here and there in the faint uh, dawn wind. I spoke to her, he muttered after a long silence. I told her she might fool me, but she couldn't fool God. I took her to the window. With an effort, he got up and walked over to the rear, um, rear window and leaned his face um, pressed against it. And I said, God knows what you've been doing, everything you've been doing. You may fool me, but you can't fool God. What is he looking out at, do you think? It's right where the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg are looking down. And so he said, he took, he took her to the window and he's like, you can fool me, but you can't fool God. Well, Michael sees that and he's like, that's a billboard, dude. Do it. Do it. No, he was just the billboard of the eyes. And he's like, that's God. God saw you. 
I just Michaelis is a really good friend because I'd be like, oh. um, standing behind him, Michaelis saw with a shock that he was looking at the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg, which had just emerged, pale and enormous, from a dissolving night. God sees everything, repeated Wilson. That's an advertisement, Michaelis assured him. Something made him turn away from the window and look back into the room. But Wilson stood there a long time, his face close to the open to the window pane, nodding into the twilight. By six o'clock, Michaelis was worn out and grateful for the sound of a car stopping outside. It was one of the watchers from the night before who had promised to come back. So he cooked breakfast for three, which he and the other man ate together. Wilson was quieter now. And Michaelis went home to sleep. And when he awoke four hours later and hurried back to the garage, Wilson was gone. His movements, he was all on foot all the time, were afterwards traced to Port Roosevelt and then to Gads Hill, where he bought a sandwich that he didn't eat and a cup of coffee. He must have been tired and walking slowly, for he didn't reach Gads Hill until noon. Thus far, there was no difficulty in accounting for his time. There were two boys who had seen a man acting sort of crazy and motorists at whom he had stared oddly from the side of the road. Then for three hours, he disappeared from view. The police on the strength of what he had said to Michaelis that he had a way of finding out, supposed that he spent that time going from garage to garage thereabout inquiring of a yellow car. So this is much later, they realized where you know, they, people saw him. Okay, he went here and the, these kids saw him and then they went here, he was looking at me kind of crazy. For three hours, nobody saw him, so they didn't really know. But they just, the police just assumed that, is there going to be damage to the car? Yeah. So the car's got to be taken to a garage, right? So his way of finding out, they just assumed, would his, was him going to different garages and seeing if anybody brought in a car that needed to be fixed. I'm about to be really irreverent right now, but y'all, Myrtle was a big girl. There was a lot of damage to the car. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. But I'm not wrong. Um, okay, so they just assumed that's where he was, okay? Um, on the other hand, no garage man who had seen him ever came forward. And perhaps he had an easier, sure way of finding out what he wanted to know, which we know is what? Asking Tom. By half past two, he was in West Egg, where he asked someone the way to Gatsby's house. So by then, he knew Gatsby's name. At two o'clock, Gatsby put on his bathing suit and he left word with the butler that if anyone phoned, word was to be brought to him at the pool. He stopped at the garage for a, it's like a floaty mattress that ha had amused his guests during the summer and the chauffeur helped him pump it up. Then he gave instructions that the open car wasn't to be taken out under any circumstances. And this was strange because the front right fender needed repair. Gatsby shouldered the mattress and started for the pool. Once he stopped and shifted a little and the chauffeur asked him if he needed some help, but he shook his head and in a moment disappeared among the yellowing trees. No telephone message arrived, but the butler went without sleep and waited for it until four o'clock, until long after there was anyone to give it to if it came. I have an idea that Gatsby himself didn't believe it would come and perhaps he no longer cared. If that was true, he must have felt that he had lost the old warm world paid a high price for living too long with a single dream. He must have looked up at the unfamiliar sky through frightening leaves and shivered as he found what a, gro what a grotesque thing a rose is and how raw the sunlight was upon the scarcely created grass. A new world, material without being real, where poor ghosts, breathing dreams like air, drifted fortuitously about, like the ashen, fantastic figure gliding toward him through the amorphous trees. The chauffeur, he was one of Wilshine's protégés, heard the shots. Afterwards, he could say only that he hadn't thought anything much about them. I drove from the station directly to Gatsby's house and my rushing anxiously up to the front steps was the first thing that alarmed anyone. But they knew then, I firmly believe. With scarcely a word said, four of us, the chauffeur, butler, gardener, and I hurried down to the pool. There was a faint, barely perceptible movement of the water as the fresh flow from one end urged its way toward the drain at the other. With little ripples that were hardly the shadows of waves, 
The laden mattress moved irregularly down the pool. A small gust of wind that scarcely corrugated the surface was enough to disturb its accidental course with its accidental burden. The touch of a cluster of leaves revolved it slowly, tracing like the leg of a transit, a thin red circle in the water. It was after we started with Gatsby toward the house that the gardener saw Wilson's body a little way off in the grass and the Holocaust was complete. What happened? Wilson killed Gatsby in the pool while he was waiting for Daisy to call and she never called. And then Wilson killed himself. Yeah. So that's where we're stopping, but go back to where now, obviously we know it's foreshadowing, but underline the part where it said, um, I gotta find it, hold on. He must have felt that he had lost the old warm world, this part right here, paid a high price for living too long with a single dream. What was his single dream? Daisy, to have Daisy. And did he work on any other things, you know, about like for himself or anything like that? So that's one of the, um, the things that I need y'all to understand. Obviously love people and, you know, do what you want in terms of, you know, romance and stuff, but you're not going to find every part of happiness and every part of everything you need in one person. So basically the fact that this caused him to die was his dream, his single dream. And so the price that he paid too high, according to Fitzgerald, was that he, um, he y'all, he took the credit for her. I mean, doing this. I mean, think about it. He died because he loved Daisy. He didn't want Daisy to get in trouble. Now, are there other people in play? Yes, of course. And we're going to learn about that. But y'all, he died. So there's a part in the film that I'm going to show you a little bit later um, where when it happens and it didn't happen in the book, but when it happens, he's getting out of the pool because he hears the phone ring and he thinks it's Daisy because she's going to finally call. He's waiting. He's been waiting all morning and he gets up to, um, to answer it. Well, that's when he gets shot. And it makes it, Hollywood did this, made it look like he died thinking that Daisy had finally called. But it wasn't him. It was Nick on the phone just trying to get a hold of him. So like on one side, I'm like, okay, Hollywood, you made it a little bit more tragic. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's not the way it happened in the book. But y'all, y'all. <sighs> okay, so on Monday, we're going to talk about um, how, we're going to find out how George found out. What do y'all think? People who haven't read it or haven't seen it. But how did George find out about who, on the who's on the billboard? I feel like he was on the billboard. Oh, like he was looking at, but how did he find out who Gatsby was is what I mean. Oh. And the car is pretty famous, right? Because people have been, yeah. No, he's just looking at it. God sees everything. He probably, if Michaelis wasn't there, he probably would have. Um, okay. So um, no questions or anything like that. Just do on this all weekend. Get angry at um, Daisy and Tom. Um, and we can't, I don't really blame George right now, though. I'm glad, I'm sad that Gatsby died, obviously, but. George was mourning, you know what I mean? And George had no idea. He killed him thinking that this man had a, an affair with his wife and killed his wife. Yep. Without knowing the whole story. And then he killed himself. But why Tom? Tom told him it wasn't my car. You know what I mean? Tom has no, he has no idea or had no idea that Tom was the one, you know? Jeez. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, okay. Um, Grayson, you good? Grayson. Their camera's off, so I'm just trying to. Grayson. Hey, um, I got your text, and I'm going to text you back a little bit later about that. Cool? All right. So I'll talk to you soon. Have a good weekend.
didn't want to do it. I didn't know it's safe. So did you know too? Also, yeah. I didn't know who was dying. Oh, you just know somebody did. Oh. I didn't watch it though. I know, but why would they put that on the thing? That's so bad.